Hello everyone, welcome back to the Intelligent Research Channel. In today's video, I will review one of my growth stock portfolios here. Specifically, I will show you how to pick the best stocks and grow a stock portfolio exponentially over the long run. Before it starts, I want to give you some context first. At the time of making this video, the S&P 500 is officially in a bull market, since the S&P 500 has recovered more than 20% from the most recent bottom here. This rally is mainly driven by the largest tech companies such as Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Nvidia, Tesla, and Meta. Because of the current AI boom, that's pushing many investors to invest in tech companies that will likely benefit from artificial intelligence, specifically generative AI. Year to date, the S&P 500 has represented by the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF here has recovered nearly 16%, while the Nasdaq 100 as represented by the QQQ ETF here has recovered much more at around 39%. In the past one year, you can see the S&P 500 has recovered slightly more than 20%, and the Nasdaq 100 has recovered nearly 36%. The Fed started hiking rates aggressively in March 2022. At the time of making this video, you can see the S&P 500 ETF here is almost back to the same level as in March 2022. More importantly, the Nasdaq 100 ETF here is already higher than what it was in March 2022. This suggests that the market is no longer too worried about the US economy going into a recession in the upcoming months. In fact, the market expects that the Fed will have much smaller rate hikes this year and expect that the Fed will start pivoting or lowering rates by the end of the year or sometime in 2024. So in this video, I'm going to talk about these topics. I will show you how to pick the best stocks and grow your stock portfolio over time. Don't fight the Fed. Don't bet against America's economic tailwind. Don't chase stocks. Why it's important to see stocks the same way as buying businesses, how to pick the best stocks, and why it's important to always invest for the long term. If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on the notification button. I will continue to make many excellent stock reviews and investing videos a week that will help you become a great investor. Each video usually takes me 20 to 30 hours to make, so if you like this channel and want to support it, check out my Patreon blog in the video description. Our goal is to help all our members grow their stock portfolios to over 7 figures over time. Once you become a Patreon member, you can follow all the stocks I'm investing in for the long term, and download the latest intrinsic value calculators for all the stocks I'm analyzing, so you will know when a stock becomes undervalued, fairly valued, or overvalued now. Also, you have access to all my latest stock ratings for all the stocks I'm analyzing. The link is in the video description. Take a look, let's start. When it comes to investing, one of the most important things is not to bet against the Fed, or in other words, don't fight the Fed. The reason is very simple. The Fed's monetary policy, such as raising rates when inflation is high, or lowering rates when they want to grow the US economy, have the largest impact on the US stock market, as represented by the S&P 500. Instead of fighting the Fed, I believe a much smarter way of investing is to understand what the Fed is trying to accomplish and understand the Fed's monetary policy direction. Here's an example. For many months, the US Fed Chair Jerome Powell said that he does not expect rates to decrease in 2023, but the market believed that the Fed was bluffing. In fact, the market made a mistake and believed that the Fed will decrease rates in 2023. Because of the slowing inflation rate in the US, many investors were betting against the Fed's monetary policies. Now, according to the FOMC meeting, the Fed is expected to have two more rate hikes in 2023 because the US inflation is not slowing down fast enough. The US inflation, especially surfaces inflation, seems to be much more persistent and entrenched than what the Fed initially forecasted. The US labor market is still very tight. More importantly, the Fed is not planning to lower rates until sometime in 2024 when the US PCE inflation is expected to be much lower. The market was wrong to bet against the Fed. According to the latest FOMC economic projections here, the Fed is expected to raise its Fed funds rate two times this year, starting in July. The Fed expects that the medium Fed funds rate will need to be 5.6% or even slightly higher by the end of the year. Then they expect that they will start lowering rates starting in 2024, when the core PC inflation is expected to be much lower. According to the CME Fed Watch 2 here, the market is still betting against the Fed's monetary policies. 
At the time of making this video, the market thinks that the Fed will only raise its interest rate once instead of twice this year to a target range between 5% and 5.25% by the end of the year. Instead of trying to predict how high the Fed funds rates will be, I think it's more important to understand the Fed's monetary policy direction going forward. For example, when the market was near the bottom here, the Fed already forecasted that they will not lower rates in 2023. Instead, they forecasted that they will likely start lowering rates sometime in 2024. Instead of fighting with the Fed, I think a much smarter way to invest is to buy the deep every month, especially when stock prices are low, even before the Fed starts pivoting. By the time we wait for the Fed to start pivoting and start lowering rates, it will be too late because most stocks will be more expensive. So this is what I did last year. I bought more mega cap tech stocks such as Microsoft and Google when the market was in a large bear market. Personally, I think it was a smart decision since most of the tech company stock prices were much lower. Here's another important lesson. Warren Buffett has said this many times before. Never bet against America. In other words, don't bet against America's long-term economic tailwind. Buffett wrote this in his 2022 shoulder letter. I have been investing for 80 years, more than one-third of our country's lifetime. Despite our citizens' pension almost enthusiasm for self-criticism and self-doubt, I have yet to see a time when it makes sense to make a long-term bet against America. And I doubt very much that any reader of this letter will have a different experience in the future. I know there are many investors who like to time the market and short sell stocks because they believe they can predict the stock market, predict stock prices, predict when the market will crash, or predict when the market will rally. Personally, I still have not met an investor who can make money consistently by speculating, trying to predict the market and shorting the market. Short selling is very risky if you time the market wrong or if your prediction is not correct. Generally speaking, short selling is much riskier than going long because time is against you. For example, time is not your friend when you are shorting a stock or shorting the market such as the S&P 500 or the Nasdaq 100. In theory, the maximum profit from shorting is 100%. There is no limit to how much you can lose if you short a stock or short the entire market. For most investors, I believe it's much better to go long on the market such as the S&P 500 instead of trying to time the market and bet against the market. Here's an example not to bet against America. In my opinion, the S&P 500 is one of the best investments in the long run. Even Warren Buffett recommends most investors invest in a very low-cost S&P 500 index fund over the long run. Instead of picking individual stocks, I believe one of the best ways to invest is to keep buying a very low-cost S&P 500 ETF, especially when there's a large dip or when there's a large bear market. Then buy and hold the S&P 500 over the long run. This way, you will likely outperform most fund managers. For example, the S&P 500 had a minor drop in 2018. Then during the peak of the pandemic in March 2020, the S&P 500 had a very large drop for a few months. Fast forward to 2022, the S&P 500 was in a bear market and was down more than 20% from the peak to 12. Instead of betting against the market, I believe a smart way of investing is to keep buying the dip whenever the S&P 500 is in a large correction or in a large bear market. Here is the important point I'm trying to make. In my opinion, I don't think anyone can predict the market accurately most of the time. It never makes sense to try to time the market and try to predict stock prices. I think it's almost impossible to predict what the market will do tomorrow, next week, next month, or next year. Not even professional investors, money managers, and Wall Street analysts can predict the market accurately. Here's one recent example. In the past one year, when the S&P 500 was still in a bear market, many professional investors, money managers, and Wall Street analysts were very bearish. They made a mistake and predicted that the market would drop further in 2023 because of the many negative macroeconomic headwinds that are affecting the market. Fast forward to today, after the S&P 500 has recovered more than 20% from the recent bottom, many of the same professional investors, money managers, and Wall Street analysts have become much more bullish. Like many times before, not even professional investors and Wall Street analysts can predict the market accurately. In my opinion, it never makes sense to try to time the market, predict the stock market, or bet against the market, especially the S&P 500 or the Nasdaq 100. For most investors who don't have the time or the expertise to research their own stocks, I believe a much better long-term investing strategy is to keep buying the entire market, such as the S&P 500 or the Nasdaq 100, over time. Then keep buying more shares whenever there are large dips or whenever there's a large correction. More importantly, own them for the long term. Warren Buffett also recommends most people just buy and hold a very low-cost S&P 500 index fund over the long run. You can bet on America, but you gotta have to be careful about how you bet, simply because markets can do anything. There's no reason 
to use borrowed money to participate in the American tailwind, but there's every other reason to participate. If you uh, bet on America and sustain that position for decades, you're going to do better than, in my view, far better than owning treasury securities or far better than following people who tell you that what the farmer's going to yell out next. Uh, there's huge amounts of money that, that people pay for advice they really don't need. And for advice where the person giving it, it can be very well meaning in it and believe their own line. But the truth is that you can't have, you can't deliver superior results to everybody by just having them trade around a business. Uh, a business that's going to deliver what the business produces and and the idea that you can outsmart the person next to you or that the person advising you can outsmart the next the person sitting next to you is is uh well it's really the wrong approach so find businesses get a cross section in my view for most people the best thing to do is to own the s p 500 index of course, past return does not guarantee future results. Generally speaking, as long as the U.S. economy is doing well and the U.S. GDP per capita is growing consistently over the long run, the entire market, such as the S&P function, will also perform very well over the long run. Personally, instead of trading stocks, owning a very low-cost S&P function index over the long run makes a lot more sense if I don't have the time to do my own research on stocks. Trading stocks will not make sense if, let's say, you cannot outperform the market, such as the S&P function, over the long run. When you're trading stocks, you're essentially timing the market and trying to predict the stock market. In my view, I think a buy and hold strategy is much better for most investors. Here's a personal example. This one my stock portfolios here. I also have other stock portfolios that have almost the same stocks and the same buy and hold investing strategy. All my portfolios are doing very well because I've invested in some of the best businesses, such as Apple, Adobe, Microsoft, Alphabet, Visa, and Mastercard. Also, all my portfolios are outperforming the S&P function by a large margin because I've invested in many large cap tech companies such as Microsoft, Alphabet, AMD, TSMC, and ASML that will likely benefit from the current AI boom. One of my biggest mistakes is that I sold my Nvidia shares too early last year to make a profit, so I will likely buy back my Nvidia shares once the stock becomes undervalued again. Personally, I don't like trading stocks because I cannot predict the market. I do not know what the market will do tomorrow, next week, next month, next six months, or next year. Instead, I like to own shares of the best businesses that are under value. I like to see stocks as actual businesses instead of stock takers for trading purposes only. So why is it important to look at stocks as actual businesses instead of looking at stocks as taker symbols for trading in the stock market? Buffett said this in an interview with CNBC. I have no idea what the stock market is going to do tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. If you own your stocks as an investment, just like you have own an apartment, house or a farm, look at them as a business. If you're going to try to buy and sell them based on news or something your neighbor tells you, you're not going to do well. Find a good bunch of businesses and hold them. Then he said, you will not make money trying to sell stocks daily or weekly. Again, this goes back to what I said earlier, don't trade stocks. For most investors, I think it's much better to buy and hold the S&P function if you don't have the time and expertise to research your own stocks, then buy more shares whenever there are large dips and own the S&P function over the long run. This is just my personal preference. Instead of investing in the S&P function, I like to do my own research and pick my own stocks. I believe I can do much better than investing in the S&P function. However, if I don't have the time to research my own stocks, I will just buy and hold S&P function and nest that 100 over the long run. So how to pick the best stocks and what is my growth investing strategy? There are many ways to invest, but I'll share with you what I've learned over the years. Here's my growth investing strategy. This strategy has worked very well for me for many years already. My growth investing strategy is to always invest in the best businesses at underwhelming prices. Then instead of trading stocks, I like to own them for many years as long as they remain very good companies. This way, their earnings and intrinsic business values can grow exponentially over time. There are several investing principles I always follow. Rule number one, invest in what you know. Rule number two, buy the best businesses. The best businesses are the ones that have large economic moats, great management, great products and services, high return on equity, high return on invested capital, increasing earnings, and increasing free cash flows over time. Rule number three, buy when the stock is traded below its intrinsic business value to reduce risk. Rule number four, invest for the long term. Own the stocks for many years as long as they remain very good companies. Rule number one, you have to invest in what you know or only buy what you understand the most. In my opinion, this is the most important rule. This investing rule is taught by both Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch. Warren Buffett calls it, stay within your circle of competence. 
Peter Lynch calls it, invest in what you know. The reason is very simple. Instead of following the latest trends or the hottest stocks right now, such as AI stocks, it's much better if you stay within your circle of competence. Invest in what you know and find the best businesses you understand the most right now. For example, if you work in the tech industry, you will likely know the best companies to invest in right now before professional investors and Wall Street analysts catch on. This is because you will have the first working knowledge of your industry. You will know the latest tech, the latest trends, and the most competitive companies in your industry before professional money managers and Wall Street analysts find out. Also, if you stay within your circle of competence and invest in what you know, you will likely know what stocks or which businesses to stay away from. For example, if you work in the banking industry, you will probably know which banks are best managed and which banks have the least amount of credit risk, liquidity risk, and investment risk, even before professional money managers and Wall Street analysts catch on. Rule number two, buy the best businesses. My growth investing strategy is to always invest in the best businesses that are undervalued. I love technology. Personally, tech is my circle of competence, so I always like to look for the best businesses that are more tech-focused. Tech companies in general tend to have the highest growth over the long run. If you look at my portfolio here, you will notice that I mainly invest in the largest tech companies that are well-established. For example, I've invested in Apple, Adobe, AMD, Amazon, ASML, Salesforce, Alphabet, Microsoft, PayPal, Tesla, and Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. The only non-tech companies in this portfolio are American Express, Intuit Inc., Monstercard, S&P Global Inc., and Visa. At the time of making this video, almost all these companies are performing very well, mainly because of their large economic modes, their great products and services, their management, their great long-term prospects, and their increasing earnings and increasing free cash flows over time. In my opinion, most of these companies are the best and the most competitive businesses in their industries. I bought many of them when they were much more underweight before. This is why this portfolio is beating the S&P 500. For example, I bought Apple shares before Warren Buffett started investing in Apple. I use iPhone, iPad, and Mac every day. So I know Apple has a very sticky ecosystem that's almost impossible for competitors to duplicate. Once you're used to using an iPhone, iPad, and other Apple services, it's almost impossible for you to leave Apple's ecosystem. The only option is moving to the Android ecosystem. I bought Adobe shares before the current AI boom started. I use Adobe Photoshop a lot, so I know that Adobe Photoshop is the gold standard for graphics design. I also know that Adobe apps are very popular in graphics design and video editing. Adobe has a very profitable subscription-based business known as Creative Cloud, so I decided to invest in Adobe. I bought Microsoft shares long before ChatGPT was released to the public. I decided to invest in Microsoft because I use Microsoft Office applications every day. I know that Microsoft has a monopoly on many products and services. For example, Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Office are near monopolies. Microsoft has a very profitable cloud business. Microsoft Azure is the second largest cloud provider in the world after Amazon Web Services. Microsoft also has the Xbox console and the very popular Xbox Game Pass. I decided to invest in Microsoft long before the AI boom started because I noticed Microsoft has some of the best cloud services and has near monopolies like Windows and Microsoft Office. Rule number three, buy only when the stock is traded below its intrinsic basis value. It is important not to buy a stock when it is overpriced. In my view, it is much smarter to buy a stock when it is traded below its intrinsic basis value so the risk is lower. Buffett has said this many times before, the price is what you pay and value is what you get. I always use this interest value calculator to calculate each company's intrinsic business value, so I will know when a stock becomes undervalued, fairly value, or overvalued. If you want this calculator, you can download it from my Patreon blog. The link is in the video description. For example, based on my interest in wealth calculation here, if Apple is worth around $153 per share, it would not make sense to buy Apple when its current price is higher than its intrinsic business value. Earlier this year, when Apple had this large dip, I bought more Apple at $125 per share, near the bottom here, because I knew Apple was greatly undervalued based on my interest in value calculation. Last year, I knew Microsoft was greatly undervalued based on my intrinsic value calculation, so I bought more Microsoft shares during the large bear market last year. Here's another example. Last year, I made the mistake of selling my Nvidia shares too early to take a short-term profit. Based on my intrinsic value calculation here, I believe Nvidia stock is substantially overvalued now because of the current AI hype. Based on my calculation, I believe Nvidia is worth around $233 per share. So I'm planning to buy by Nvidia once Nvidia drops below my intrinsic value estimate, which is $233 per share. 
I think it's important to buy a stock only when it's fairly priced or better when it's undervalued to reduce the risk of overpaying a stock. Rule number four, invest for the long term. Own the stocks for many years as long as they remain good companies. Warren Buffett said this before, all there is to investing is picking good stocks at good times. This means buying shares of great businesses when they're undervalued. This is the same growth investing strategy I talked about in this video. Then he said, staying with them as long as they remain good companies. This is the important part. While I think it is important to always invest for the long term, I think it makes sense to sell when a stock is no longer a good business. I'll give you an example here to explain when it makes sense to sell a stock when it's no longer a good business. Intel used to be the market leader in the semiconductor market for many years. Intel used to have a monopoly in the CPU market. However, Intel has experienced many product delays and mismanagement over the years. As a result, it has now lagged behind its main competitors, such as AMD and TSMC in crucial areas like chip design, chip manufacturing, and process node technologies. In fact, over two years ago, I made this Intel stock analysis video. I predicted that Intel is a value trap. Fast forward to today, you can see Intel has underperformed the S&P 500 and its biggest competitor, AMD, substantially during this period here. I think the important lesson is this. If a stock is no longer a good business, I think it makes sense to sell it earlier instead of holding it and hoping it will recover. However, if a stock is a great business that is very well managed, with large economic modes, great products and services, high return on invested capital, and increasing earnings and increasing free cash flows over time, then I think it makes sense to own the business for many years, so its earnings and intrinsic business value can grow much more over the long run. Now, all these are only my opinions and my analysis based on my research. They are not financial wise. There are always risks associated with investing. You will need to do your own research and do your extra due diligence first before investing anything. Thank you for watching this video and supporting our channel. This is Victor from the Intelligent Research Channel, and I will see you in the next video.